On September 27, 2024, Jujutsu Kaisen released its final chapter and with it came a lot of controversy. Since its release 6 years ago, the series has become one of my all time favorites and is considered by many as one of the greatest manga to come out for the new generation. I've seen so many people say that the latter half of JJK took a massive nosedive in quality and that JJ had fallen off. I stopped reading after the Shibuya arc so I was shocked to hear about this. The thought of JJK becoming mid never occurred to me because of how perfect the first half of the series was. It had an amazing cast of characters that everyone loved, action packed story with some depth to it, and even an anime with a studio that overworked its animators. The recipe for success was basically laid out for them and yet, somehow, they still messed it up. So what happened at the end? Personally, the second half didn't kill the series for me, it just felt like a step down from what we got in the Shibuya arc. There were still many memorable moments like Higuruma vs Yuji, Akari vs Kashimo, and the obvious one being Gojo vs Sukuna, but even that had too many problems that I'll get into later. The main problem was that the cons outweighed the pros for me to truly enjoy the arc as a whole. This video is the second part of my JJK series review and if you haven't seen the first one, I recommend watching that one as it highlights what I love about the series. With that out of the way, let's get started. After the Shibuya arc, it's revealed to us that Ghetto, or Kenjaku as it's revealed later on, plans to evolve humanity into a new being via curse technique. To do so, he creates a big deathmatch called the Calling Games. It's essentially a battle royale between curse users from the past and present to determine who gets to live in this new world. Yuji and the others participate in the Calling Games so that they can change the rules in order to save Megumi's sister. This arc is one of the most divisive ones that I've seen in the fanbase. On one hand, we have people say that the arc had dragged on for too long and that it felt like one endless loop of fights one after another. On the other hand, we have people saying that the arc isn't as bad as we make it out to be and that we should have binged the whole arc in one go. As someone that did the latter half, I honestly think that the arc was a step down from what we would have expected from the series. Narratively, this arc created too many plotlines that had no payoff, it introduced way too many characters that I did not care about, and fights had no emotional baggage to them. Before I explain why, I first want to highlight some of my favorite parts of the arc. Despite its flaws, I still enjoyed this arc and what it had to offer. One of those is Kenjaku's character. I didn't talk about him in the last video, but I think he's one of the best well-written villains in the series. He's a mad scientist that dedicated his life to his experiments and was behind a majority of the important events and moments in the story. The best thing about his character is that he knows that his plans won't always work and has to adapt to the situation. In a way, he feels like a more realistic version of Aizen, using his past experiments to account for any variables and not having this perfect 200 IQ plan. When you compare him to Sukuna, who feels more like a force of nature, Kenjaku feels like the true antagonist of the series because of how much he's affected the world. He doesn't want to rule humanity or become the new king of curses. He just wants to see what this evolved human would look like and will do whatever it takes to see it. And when I say he'll do whatever it takes, he really does. You see, in the chapters leading up to the Culling Game arc, we see that Yuji has been dealing with curses with Choso. It's here that we finally learn about Yuji's family and how Choso is related to him. They hinted that Kenjaku might be Yuji's father when Choso asks if he remembers his father having any stitches. Before getting an answer, we're interrupted by Naoya and Yuta. They fight and Yuji has a near-death experience, remembering things in his past that he never saw. It's through this that we learn about his origin and the reality is more messed up than we think. We learn that Kenjaku isn't Yuji's father, he's actually his mother. Hey, yo, what the fuck? That's right, Kenjaku stole Kaori's body and used it to give birth to Yuji because his father was the reincarnation of Sukuna's brother and his child was the only one who could contain Sukuna. So instead of doing literally anything else to create Yuji, he decides nah, I'll take back shots. I know JJ wanted to make the story weird, but this was just wild. I don't want to talk about this anymore. Moving on! Next, Maki. As one of my favorite characters, I couldn't be more happy with the way JJ handled her arc. Instead of becoming another Toji, Maki has always chosen to defy the Zenin clan and was never held back by her past. Toji on the other hand was trapped by his trauma and never saw past his failures in order to be happy. He directed his anger towards Gojo, the pinnacle of the Jujutsu world, instead of the people that actually hurt and abused him. Maki however does the opposite and annihilates the Zenin clan, freeing herself from her trauma and goes on to help people because she believes that's the right thing to do. Later on, she would gain enlightenment and her smile during that moment felt earned after all she's been through. I just hated the characters that helped her with it. The characters that I do like however are Higuruma and Takaba. Out of all the characters introduced in this arc, Higuruma was definitely the best since we actually get to know his backstory and why he's in the Culling game. His curse technique is one of the most unique ones in the series, mimicking a real trial and a Shikigami representing Lady Justice. He serves as a foil to Yuji, helping him start to see that there was more to a human's life than just being a cog in a machine. This works since Higuruma is someone that's straight from his path of protecting the innocent and Yuji is someone that is innocent but still feels that the death of Shibuya was his fault. Their fight ends with Higuruma owning up to his crime of killing people, even if what they did was wrong. It's easily one of the best fights narratively and visually and is why everyone, including myself, loved this character. Takaba on the other hand is just a goofy character that I find hard to hate. 
He feels like a nice breather from all the fights that we've been getting since he basically serves as a comic relief. It's also funny that he's the most powerful sorcerer in the entire series because of how he can alter reality. His fight with Kenjaku is the weirdest thing I've seen in a manga and is unironically one of the best fights in the series. JJ didn't really let us spend enough time with them and their only appearance afterwards is in the last battle with Sakuna and the second to last chapter. Higuruma comes off as another Nanami with the way he's dressed and how he influences Yuji. When comparing the two, Nanami's death was more devastating since we got to know him as a character and see him spend time with others. Higuruma's death was sad, but I didn't care as much since we didn't get enough screen time with him, and it didn't really matter in the end since he's perfectly fine in the last chapter. Takaba doesn't even die in his final fight, he just lays there after going on an acid trip with Kenjaku. It's unfortunate that these two are the last things I like about the arc because from here on, this is where I talk about the things I don't like. As a battle shonen, I think it's a given that the fights need to be good, otherwise you end up with a subpar slice of life story with just some action thrown in there. One of the things that JJK does right is making fights visually appealing and hype as hell while still having some depth to them. So when you compare these fights to the one in Shibuya, they fall flat narratively with how little we know about the characters. Since the start of the arc, you get Yuji fighting Higuruma, Megumi fighting Reggie, Yuta fighting the Sendai crew, and Hakuri fighting Manga Dude and Kashimo. I didn't know what his name was and I was too lazy to look it up. I'm sorry guys. This was all back to back and as someone that binged all these fights in one go like everyone said to, I still think that there was too many to keep up with. There were practically no chapters to establish some type of backstory in between fights and all we got was a small text box explaining who they were. I read online how this felt like another tournament arc and I could see where they were going with. We're given some lore about them during their fights and it would have been great to see them being expanded in later chapters. Instead of getting that though, these characters just get deleted from the story. Their only purpose was to show where Yuji and the other stands in terms of power level and once they were beaten, they were essentially killed off if they didn't decide to help out in the final fight. Like what the actual fuck JJ, you had such unique and interesting characters that were in some of the best fights in the entire series and you could have easily added in a couple chapters to flesh them out. It would have been good to see more of Uro's backstory or even just more interactions with Higuruma with the other characters. Instead they're written out of the story in favor of Sumo Guy and Katana Guy. I seriously couldn't care less about these two and I hated how their only purpose was to help Maki beat Naoya. With Shibuya, the villains were built up with personality and lore behind them that made them stand out as interesting characters. Except for Cockroach Guy, we don't talk about him. It would have been amazing to see these characters help in the final fight, or at least go out in a good way like how the Disaster Courses did. But no, they just get sent to the Shadow Realm and are never seen again. Surely the main cast at least gets a satisfying end to their story and are given a lot more respect though, right? Right? I mentioned in my last video that the cast in JJK were some of the best written characters in any series that I've seen in a while. My point still stands and I still really like them, I just wish JJ liked them as well. Inomaki and Panda are basically non-existent in the story even though they were literally Maki's closest friends. They could have easily replaced Katana and Sumo guys since they actually mean something to her. But what do I know, I'm just a guy that makes videos on manga. And I don't even need to say anything about the Kyoto High group. Momo does nothing, Mimo gets chapped because of her heavenly restriction, and the other two are just dead. Kamo and Toto at least do something, but their overall impact is worthless. Kamo is cool, but Choso is literally an upgraded version of him and his only appearance is in Maki's rematch with Naoya. Bro doesn't even show up to the last fight, he just dips out of the country and is never seen again. Toto on the other hand does show up in the final fight, but this is literally his only appearance. One of the best characters from the entire series is reduced to shock value and gets clapped protecting one of the most wasted characters in the entire arc. Hanakurusu has one of the most broken curse techniques in the entire story and was supposed to be important in taking down Sukuna. Instead of that, all she does is simp for Megumi and frees Gojo from the prison realm. Her entire character is nothing more than a glorified key just so we can get the not nah, I'd win me. And since we're on the topic of wasted character, let's talk about Yuki Tsukumo. She served as the foil to Ghetto and Kenjaku's philosophy and as a former Star Plasma vessel. As someone who's heavily connected to two of the most important characters in the Jujutsu society, Yuki was built up as one of the most interesting characters in the series. From her design, her looks, and being one of the only four special grade sorcerers, she became a fan favorite among the community and was meant to be someone that would change the Jujutsu world. But I guess JJ didn't see it that way because all she does in this arc is give advice to Choso and gets obliterated by Kenjaku's ass pull technique. You cannot convince me that him having an anti-gravity technique wasn't bullshit. I guess taking all those backshots really did mean something, huh? We never get to see her use her domain expansion and her fight amounts to nothing since Kenjaku didn't suffer any serious wounds. Her ideals of getting rid of curses become meaningless since curses are still prevalent and no one seems to be interested in getting rid of them completely. It sucks even more because Toto doesn't even acknowledge her death at all. It would have been so interesting to see more of her relationship with Tengen and to see her ideas on how to get rid of curse energy. But no, we never see any of this. As a Yuki fan, this hurts my soul and talking about it sucks. Even so, there's another character who hurts me more than Yuki. Easily one of the biggest disappointments for me was Megumi's entire character arc. Throughout the series, he was hyped up to potentially become one of the strongest sorcerers in the series, possibly even stronger than Gojo himself. As someone who actually likes Megumi, I was all for it and I was excited to see how strong this character was going to get. 
but just like everyone else I've talked about, he gets wasted as well. Sure, I'm mad that he never got to reach his peak, but what makes me more mad is what JJ did to him as a character. Since the start of the series, his only purpose for living was to save his sister Sumiki and it's the only reason he's in the Cullen game at all. So when JJ had Yorozu take over her body and then Sukuna take over his body, I was just over it man. Having Megami's entire reason for being a sorcerer and possibly even living just gone was just wasteful. I couldn't be bothered to care for Sumiki since I don't know anything about her and her entire character was just a plot device for Sukuna to control Megami. It was also super weird and creepy how she wanted to marry Sukuna, who was in Megumi's body. If you try to justify this by saying, oh, it's okay, they were possessed by different people, so it's technically not Sweet Home Alabama. I'm sorry, but you're also a weirdo. JJ, this isn't that type of manga. Please just go back to making Yuji depressed. So, in order to avoid the allegations, Sukuna checks her and Megumi out of the story completely. I didn't hate how depressed he became, like how some people say, since it makes sense why he would feel this way. I just hated how he was stripped of his motivation and is the exact same character he was at the beginning by the end of the series. His arc of learning about self-love is non-existent and he will forever be known as the man with the most wasted potential in JJK. Other problems I had was the army side plot. This gets deleted in like two chapters and their only purpose was to get rid of the other side characters that JJ made. They were also used to create more cursed energy but it would have been so much easier for the people of Japan to be the source. Kenjaku has already murdered people in Shibuya and I don't think this would have been out of character at all. So what's the difference now? Next, Kashimo. I don't need to say anything more than that so we're just gonna move on. Next, Hakari. He's cool, but I really don't care about him. He gets one cool fight and is shafted afterwards. It also doesn't help that his domain expansion is confusing as hell and I had to look up how it works. Finally, the last problem I had was the other clans never being brought up. You would think that these guys would play a big role since they're literally the backbone of the Jujutsu society. The Gojo clan don't even care that their leader is gone and the Kamo clan are even more non-existent than they were before. The Zenin clan gets some characterization, but they end up in the same boat since they get murked by Maki Uchiha. As a Maki fan, I loved it, but I feel like they should have been given more screen time before getting wiped. Okay, I think that's all the problem I had. Now that that's out of the way, we can finally talk about the final fight, which I'm sure is going to be absolutely perfect. Let's be honest here, no matter how much we criticize the last arc, there's no denying that everyone was hyped up for Gojo vs Sakuna. The presentation, the choreography, the stakes, everything was just perfect. Being the strongest individuals from their respective time, you would think one would have the advantage over the other, but that isn't the case here. They both hold their own, using every technique and ability that they've mastered, creating one of the most technical and visually appealing fights that I've ever seen. From Gojo unleashing a 200% hollow purple, to the back-to-back -back domain expansions, the hype just kept wrapping up and there was never any dull moments when I read it. It also helps that I read the entire fight in one go, so there's never any waiting in between chapters. As a side note, I also find it funny how the fight was broadcast to everyone as if it was just some big sporting event. I have my gripes with the second half of JJK post Shibuya, but this fight almost made up for how mediocre it was. And I mean it when I say almost, because somehow JJ still fumbled the bag with this fight. As a reader, we all knew that Yuji needed to be the one to beat Sukuna since, you know, he's the main character. But this could have been handled way better. In the last moments of the fight, Gojo fires a hollow purple at Sukuna and all the characters are saying that he's won. We all know he doesn't, but throughout the fight, Gojo was steadily beating him. And my assumption is that in the next chapter, Sukuna would be wounded enough for the characters to have a chance. I knew Gojo would die in this fight, but I didn't think JJ would do this to him. You see, in the next chapter, we're shown an airport scene with all the dead characters, and after some reminiscing, we're shown that our 6 foot king has become a 3 foot king. Everyone was shocked by this death, to the point that another mangaka had to take a break to process this death. It was a sad day for everyone, but at least we get some closure on how he beats Gojo. Wait, hold on guys, I'm getting a call. Hello? What? What do you mean it's not what happens? He just explains how he beats him? What do you mean he cuts space itself? What the fuck do you mean it just works? Is he King Crimson? <sighs> well, at least the other characters can finish him off, right? No? Then what the fuck was the point of all of this? Throughout the fight, Gojo was gaining the advantage over Sukuna, overcoming his domain expansion's weakness, and was still able to hold his own even after he summoned Mahuraga and Akito. This really is the case of you winning the boss fight but losing in the cutscene. It's also worse when Sukuna goes into his second phase and is completely fine after their fight. This invalidates all of Gojo's hard work since the characters now have to fight a more powerful version of him at full health. At that point, everybody should have just jumped him together. Kashimo could have been helpful, but he just gets killed off in one chapter. The final fight with Yuji and the others isn't even that good either. It just feels so repetitive and long. The whole structure is that a character shows up, fights for a bit, and then gets clipped by Sukuna. There were some good scenes, but it didn't have the same height to it since Sukuna isn't even going all out. He just messes with them for a little before nuking them with his malevolent shrine. They continue fighting, and just before Sukuna can Thanos snap him again, we get a teaser, and it seems as though Gojo is going to come back alive in the next chapter. 
But sorry, Gojo Simps, JJ was just pulling your chain because it's actually Yuta's brain in Gojo's body. He was an imposter, guys. Isn't that funny? Ha ha ha. Yeah, I hate this so much. Yuta sacrificing his body works to show just how dangerous Sukuna is and that the heroes can't win without losing something. Narratively, it's good on paper, but the fact that they use Gojo's body just sucks. It shows that JJ made Sukuna too strong and that he didn't know how to kill him off without having Gojo come back. It's what I would say if JJ didn't already plan stuff out for the second half. So this might have been or might have not been intentional. Either way, this doesn't make it any better since it just serves as shock value more than anything else. He doesn't even fight till the very end. He just uses his domain expansion and faints right after all in the span of two chapters. And so with everybody knocked out, the last one standing is Yuji. And so we finally get the Yuji versus Akuna fight. And I'm here to say, it's actually really good. During this fight, we finally get to see Yuji's domain expansion and it's very confusing on a first read. Throughout the fight, Yuji takes Sukuna to places that were memorable to him, telling him about what he used to do there and reminiscing about his childhood. Sukuna goes along with it, and after everything is over, he asks Yuji what it is he's trying to say, and it's here that we finally get to the conclusion to Yuji's character. Throughout this entire arc, Yuji has always had this cog mentality where everybody has a set role in life and that they need to follow it. He used to believe that everyone had a role to fill in life and that death was just another part of it. After all of his experiences, he now understands that a person's value goes beyond their role in the world. He hated Maito and Sukuna because they didn't cherish life and what it had to offer, but he couldn't judge him because he himself doesn't know who's truly right and wrong. Throughout this chapter, Yuji wanted to give Sukuna a chance to understand the importance of life, but it doesn't get through to him. He doesn't feel anything after listening to Yuji or his philosophy. He only cares about himself and has only lived for himself. Yuji's plan fails and Sukuna is shocked that this is how much his hatred for him amounts to. Throughout this entire series, Sukuna has tortured Yuji physically and mentally, killing anyone he finds annoying and not caring about the consequences. So for his hatred to mean this much is confusing to him, but it's actually much deeper than that. As Sukuna is left dumbfounded, it's revealed to us that Yuji is actually pitting Sukuna. He tells him that if he doesn't give Megumi back, he'll kill him. Having someone who he constantly trashed on pity him evokes true anger within Sukuna and is one of the rawest moments ever. It serves as a good conclusion to their relationship and the best part is that he doesn't do this just to make him angry. He genuinely pities him for not appreciating the value of life. So after that scene, we go back to the two fighting and during this time, he connects to Megami and uses Tak no Jutsu to free him. With Megami free, the two of them fight together and defeat Sukuna. Wait, sorry, no, that's not what happened. So what actually happens is Nova shows up at the last moment and uses resonance on Sukuna and this helps him win the fight. <sighs> Classic JJ, I guess. After the fight, Yuji talks to Sukuna one last time, telling him that he still has a chance to live a better life. Sukuna rejects him, telling him that he shouldn't look down on him because no matter what anyone says, he will forever be a curse. So, what were my thoughts on everything that's happened? Reading this series was a roller coaster of emotions. I had my problems with the beginning arcs as well, but structurally it was still better and it was still one of my favorite parts of the series. The second half really dipped in quality and was more focused on action rather than the narrative. I still enjoyed it, but it was just from pure hype more than anything else. I hated how the main characters got shafted in favor of the new ones, and I hate how the last chapters don't even show what they're doing outside of the main trio and Maki. Gojo's death is never acknowledged, not even by Shoko, his only remaining friend, and is only shown in Yuji's flashback. This series has so much potential, but it fumbled it, it just regressed to an average shonen. This ending isn't as bad as My Hero's ending like everyone says it is, it was just the most okay ending ever. Despite how much I've shitted on JJK, it's still one of my favorite series of all time. Yuji is still my favorite character in Shonen, the fights will forever be the best ones I've seen in years, and the main cast will always be one of my favorites. JJK will be remembered by many as a series that defined a new generation. I, however, will always remember it for the trauma that it inflicted on me and everyone else. Thank you, JJK, for 6 years of trauma. And for you guys, thank you so much for watching. And as always, stay safe, stay healthy, and keep on reading.